welcome to My Jewish Learning. We're so excited to go to Greece this month. Um, and I'll introduce our guest speaker in just a moment. In the meantime, you are welcome to put your name in the chat box and where you are joining from today. Technical notes. Captions have been enabled, so uh, you can select those from the CC menu on your Zoom screen. They are automatic captions, but we find that they're pretty good, but they are not perfect. So if there are any questions as, as things come up, please let us know. Once the presentation starts, we're going to limit the chat box um, so that you can send just to the hosts. So you can, if there's any kind of technical problem, please let me know. But at the end of the presentation, there will be some time for Q&A. Okay, we are going to get started now. So, um, Evan, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking that super music um, away from all the audio, thank you. That was that was uh, that was really beautiful to listen to, and maybe we'll hear some again uh, at the end. Um, again, my name is Julie. Um, I'm here with my Jewish Learning and Jewish Telegraph agency and um, we are so excited to be going to Greece today and uh, thank you first of all to Donnie Rothstein of Jewish Majorca for helping us organize all of these um, monthly tours and I will um, I will introduce our speaker Evan, I'm so delighted to uh, to welcome Evan Kapros, um, who will be leading our discussion today. Well, more like a lecture, but there will be time for Q and A at the end. Evan was born in Greece and later moved to Ireland. He now resides in Barcelona, where he is a volunteer at Mosaica, which is the Jewish cultural center there. When he was in Greece, Evan was involved with groups for refugee rights and against anti-Semitism. And in Ireland, he was a member of the Education Committee of the Irish Jewish Museum. Um, so lots of uh, personal knowledge as well that we're so excited um, for you to share with us today. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks everyone for coming to, to this uh, talk today. Um, I want to apologize a bit for my uh, voice because I am on the other end of uh, of a call that I had so uh, sorry about that I hope everyone is going to be able to um, hear me just fine I might cough sometime uh, sorry about that so I think um, the introduction was really good so uh, I don't need to to further introduce myself and I will uh, start with the talk proper even though this is not um, a history lecture, I do have to give some context uh, because uh, there is a rich history of uh, Jewish presence in, in Greece and I cannot do justice to, to what is um, uh, happening if I don't um, say a bit uh, what the, the, the context uh, is. So um, something that's worth noting is that the majority of uh, uh, the Greek Jews are of uh, Sephardic bar background, uh, including my uh, family. Uh, so this is a document from an inquisition case against some of my uh, own ancestors and uh, some of them uh, perished during the inquisition, but thankfully their children uh, managed to, to move out of the Iberian Peninsula. And something that some people think is that uh, this was one event that happened maybe in 1492, and then everyone kind of moved from the Iberian Peninsula to the Ottoman Empire. But actually, I would want to start off uh, as thinking in terms of expulsions in plural, because uh, this was 
many waves of inquisition that happened and this is really important in in how we tell the the story of how people from Iberia arrived in Greece in in different uh, waves uh, so there is this image that uh, people left from what people understand nowadays as Spain but it was actually different kingdoms at the time um, so people from different origins from within Spain had different experiences so uh, someone who was Jewish from Granada might have a different experience from a Jewish family from Barcelona uh, when they uh, moved out. So, for example, the case of my family is that they, uh, I think, yeah, here it is. So they were residing in what was uh, Catalonia uh, nowadays. And um, so the I clicked on the wrong thing again. So because of how the kingdoms were um, back then, first they moved to the south of Italy and they actually stayed there for quite uh, a long time and then they moved to what uh, was Greece. So these green areas on the map uh, were either uh, they directly belong to the to to Catalonia or they were affiliated regions so for the Catalan uh, Jews it was more it was easier it was places that they had more access to um, in contrast people from the south of Spain they might move more easily to Morocco because of the geographical proximity and then to Italy or uh, Greece so you have uh, different ways, different pathways, and um, families stayed in Italy for different amounts of time, even centuries before moving to Greece. So this makes the waves of expulsion and how people arrived in Greece uh, more uh, obvious. And this is why I'm talking about it and also when people arrived in Greece they found there other uh, Jews existing there there were synagogues there were communities already from the time of the Roman Empire and even before from the Empire of Alexander the, the Great so there were communities in Athens and Salonika and other places that existed there and they had their own uh, customs so, for example, here you can see um, um, this is maybe you can read from the page of on the left that this is for uh, Purim. This is the Megillat uh, Esther, basically. And if you can read the Hebrew alphabet, uh, now you can also read Greek. If this uh, sounds Greek to you when you read it, it's absolutely correct because it is Greek. So it is the um, Yevani, it is the Greek Jewish dialect of the time. Um, and so it is the story of Esther in the Greek Jewish uh, dialect written in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, so um, not uh, Ladino, not related to Spanish at all. This relates to the Greek Jews who were already there from the Roman Empire. Because they were already there from the time of the Roman Empire, we call them Romaniots. Um, the song we were listening to when you entered the room was in this dialect, and it was this very song of the, the beginning of the Megillat Esther. Uh, when, if we have time at the end, we can uh, go back and uh, have a listen. Not now, uh, but yes. So um, this map uh, shows, it is uh, difficult to show a geographical distribution of which areas had uh, Romaniots and which areas had uh, Sephardim because um, it was a really mixed affair. So this map tries to show the majority population, but of course there were places where they had uh, many different communities and mixed families, so it is very difficult to make a clear cut. Um, 
um, map of that, but in general, broadly speaking, uh, in the north near Salonika and what uh, used to be uh, Constantinople in Istanbul nowadays, uh, it was mostly Sephardim and also near uh, Athens and the islands. And mostly on Western Greece and mainland Greece, it was mostly Romaniots. But again, there are like variations. Um, in, in places you could have um, a significant uh, Sephardim, Sephardic tradition. This is mostly related to which um, was more um, dominant, but not necessarily by population. It was which Minhag was adopted at the end of the day. And also it's important to remember that the Ottoman Empire was quite big. So you also had uh, a mix of populations, the occasional uh, Mizrahi or Yemenite who would go to work in Salonika or Istanbul and they would get mixed uh, uh, with the, the Greek Jews or uh, people who left from the Hungarian pogroms of the 13th century and they went down to, um, to the Balkans. Um, so you see, for example, that these are um, Harita Zafir and uh, Lea Katzel, which are my great great grandparents. And you see that they had already um, in the late 18th century adopted the Balkan traditional dress. So they were not anymore uh, dressed with the, the Sephardi clothing because they were outside, uh, a bit outside Salonika. Uh, so this is interesting to, to see all the different influences, um, the, the mix that you find in, uh, in Greek Zeus. Um, I talked about Salonika. This is a very important place uh, to uh, Greek Zeus. For the Greek non zeus the capital of Greece is Athens. To us, the capital is Salonika um, because uh, a big majority um, of the city was uh, Sephardim who settled there uh, during the Ottoman Empire. So the city ended up being called the Jerusalem of the Balkans because of the prominent Jewish uh, presence. Um, you see that on the <laughs> city map, it's uh, start, it's Magen uh, David is um, a synagogue. So there, there were uh, many, many synagogues at the time especially near the port area. Many people would work at the port or in related industries based on the knowledge they brought with them uh, from uh, uh, Spain and um, Portugal also. So uh, there were uh, regions that you see a higher um, concentration of uh, Jewish presence or more Christians here or more uh, Muslims, uh, Turks near the um the castle because that was the administration region and they needed to be near the ottoman authorities but these regions were called mahalas so they were quarters but they were were not closed ghettos so you didn't have a gate that would be uh, closed during the night um so people would in broad strokes be living together, even though you would find uh, more uh, Jews in some places or more Christians in um, other neighborhoods of Salonika. So this lasted for uh, many centuries and there are the communities that were founded, founded in, in Salonika show the, var the variation of the expulsions, and they also show that they were very, very localized. So something that uh, is a big discussion here, but maybe not everywhere, is how would they feel? Would they feel more Spanish, more Catalan, more Portuguese? What was their affiliation? Well, uh, it looks like they would feel primarily Jewish. So that was the, the primary uh, identity that people had. And then it was very specific to the city where they would come from. So the Sicilian um, community and the Calabrian community and the Italian community would, would be separate. They wouldn't conceive themselves as, oh, we're all Italians or something like that. 
or the Majorcan and the provincial communities, they would see themselves as um, suburb. So the different um, construction dates, they show two things. One uh, might be a new uh, wave of uh, immigrants coming from uh, Italy or the Iberian Peninsula, or it can be another uh, community that grew, that grew quite big and they needed to build uh, an extra school to, for all of the, the communities. Um, I think, yeah, I, I will talk also a little bit beyond that, but the communities, they also had a certain amount of self-government and institutions, so they were not just um, the schools. I talked about the schools, but they had also schools to go with it. They had hospitals and old people homes, and they were complete uh, communities in the whole uh, sense of the of the term. There was a lot of poverty because of the continuous um, uh, migration, uh, so it was not easy. Many people would work as porters, uh, and many people. Um, started becoming itinerant um, merchants and salespeople. Uh, we start seeing some uh, discrimination at that time that uh, they were seen um, because of moving continuously as, uh, I don't know, maybe foreign or, or dirty to some uh, other uh, Greek people. Um, I talked about how the communities had uh, schools. Uh, it was difficult to figure out what to teach. And this is interesting because it was until very recently, until the time of my parents, for it was a, a problem that was prescient for 300 years or more. So should uh, Hebrew be taught or should uh, Ladino be taught, which was the everyday language and was based on uh, medieval uh, Spanish? Um, so its school had its own formula of how to split the um, the hours and one uh, positive outcome of having so many communities is that there was not one single formula that was imposed over every community but there was a lot of uh, autonomy on how to to manage the the Jewish education and the curriculum uh, in the city there were also, as I mentioned, old people's homes that they were part of the community and there were medical centers. And for this reason, many times, depending on the orientation of the community, oftentimes the head of the community, the, the, the Rosh Keila, had more power than the rabbis uh, themselves. And something that was specific for, for that time uh, in, in Greece and different to other communities is that uh, women were also head of uh, communities uh, even back then. So some things that may, some developments as not as, are not as recent as we may think them to be. Um, within the wider uh, community that there was um, more toleration rather than tolerance. Uh, the Ottoman Empire as the Byzantine Empire before it was multi-ethnic. So you will find this is a photo of a coffee place in the um, uh, 19th century and you will find uh, Christians and uh, uh, Greek Christians and uh, Jews and Slavics that you, uh, you, you understand from the different types of hat that they're wearing and they are they go to the same place to socialize uh, so and this was normal and tolerated, but it, it doesn't mean that they actively liked each other necessarily, but they wouldn't do harm to um, the other communities uh, necessarily. Um, there was a lot of press and with it, the extreme poverty started uh, slowing down a bit and we see the beginning of uh, a middle class uh, with a very strong uh, Jewish participation in Salonika and you see that there is also press in Ladino um, this time again if you can read the Hebrew alphabet and you know Spanish you can understand that uh, 
here you have the head rabbi Yaakov Meir, and he talks to the Messenzero, which is the messenger of this newspaper, uh, about the some new uh, reports from the, the the Greek government, which is the the headline how it reads uh, in in Spanish, medieval Spanish, which is what we call a dino. And you see many professional bodies, like on the right, uh, a decision from the uh, the bar, like the Lawyers Association that is published in France, Turkish, Greek, and Ladino. Uh, Turkish, uh, Greek, and Ladino make sense, but why France also? This has to do with the Ardians uh, uh, Israel Dit Universel, which was a French uh, Jewish institution that had uh, founded several schools uh, in the Ottoman Empire. So um, many Greek Jews uh, have a strong uh, uh, upbringing with French literature and uh, culture and music. Uh, even though some uh, customs from the Romaniot, the, the pre-Sephardic uh, Jewish communities remained, so some people do alephs. So an aleph is uh, something that st started as an amulet when you're born for good luck and protection against uh, the evil eye and all these things. But because it mentions the date of birth and the name of the parents, it has kind of become a sort of birth, birth certificate. So it started with a completely different purpose, but when the community started becoming more mixed, uh, from an amulet, this became uh, a birth certificate, effectively. Uh, another custom that um, uh, has been kept in, in several places are the coronas de boda, which are these uh, flower crowns that uh, you wear uh, under the chupa when you are uh, married. And this apparently, according to Byzantine historians, is a very ancient Greek custom that um, the Greeks were using irrespective of uh, religion already from uh, ancient times. So it looks like the, the, the Romaniots kept it and then it spread out to, to uh, Greek um, Jewry overall. Um, something that affected the community a lot and many people had to, to move out of uh, Salonika was uh, in 1917 that there was a great fire in, in Salonika. It affected a lot of the, the Jewish quarter. So uh, most people who had to, to leave the, because of the fire were um, uh, Salonikan Jews and they had to, to resettle. Uh, some of them resettled here in Barcelona and I want to talk about one specific family that um, is the Carasso family, and they were uh, making clothes when they were in Salonika, and they had some really big contracts. They would also make shirts for the military and so on. But then when they came here to, to Barcelona, um, the market was saturated because there was a big textile industry here. So then the youngest of the family, uh, Daniel Carasso, thought that maybe they would learn what they had learned when they were in Greece. They could apply back here uh, in Barcelona. So what did they have from Greece that the Spanish didn't have so that they could uh, trade? So uh, because of uh, little Daniel, which in uh, Ladino we would call Danona, that's the diminutive for little Daniel, they started uh, a Greek yogurt uh, business and um, they were quite uh, successful uh, with it. So every time you have a Danone, you should know that this is not just a Greek yogurt, it is also a Greek Jewish uh, yogurt from uh, originally from uh, Salonika. Um, before they moved out, my family were providing fabric for them for their uh, textile uh, business. So that's uh, something interesting also. The fire was really devastating in Salonika. I have this picture to show that here, all of this uh, part of the Jewish quarter was completely annihilated. You see that the houses, because the construction was not as solid as 
nowadays were were burned to the ground so people really had to to go there was no chance for um reconstruction uh, so we are there in a situation where still most of the population of Salonika is uh, is uh, Jewish. Uh, but then because of uh, people living out uh, because of the fire and we also have the Greco-Turkish war where uh, you see many uh, Greeks from what is now Turkey moving uh, into Salonika, the demographics of the city um, it changed a lot. So you have Greeks and Armenians who moved into Salonika. So then uh, all of a sudden, uh, only one third of the population more or less uh, were Jewish. So this was um, a very big, um, uh, th this was really bad for community ties uh, because it, it meant that um, the community was almost half than it was uh, only a few years ago. So the change was very sudden. Uh, with the change of demographics, uh, you have the first time that modern style antisemitism appears, which was more modeled after Italian um, uh, fascism and not as much uh, as the Germans at the time and uh, they would um, start trouble in the Jewish quarter uh, the new one where people went after the fire to to leave and then they would blame that uh, in the press that uh, Jewish people had started the the troubles so that was their modus uh, operandi um, so because of the violence but also because of um, trying to to find uh, new jobs and in in this new situation and because of a call of the british mandate back then to to build the port of haifa people who were uh, working as porters in the port of uh, salonica moved uh, quite uh, massively to Haifa to help build the port. So the port of Haifa is actually built in the image of the port of Salonika, and this has also been commemorated later in uh, Greek-Israeli uh, relations. Uh, this was in 1939, so you can see how uh, several of the Greek Jewish families were saved from what happened in, in Greece later on because of uh, that. <laughs> They, uh, of course, they made the song about that because they're a song about everything um, in Greece. Uh, later on, the developments after 39 were not as good. It's important to note that both uh, Germans and Italians occupied uh, Greece. There was a big uh, number of uh, Greek Jews who uh, participated in the, the, the military uh, resistance against them. It's important to note that the Italians had occupied part of Greece and the, the Germans and the Bulgars, different part of Greece, because the survival rate in the Italian occupied part was higher than in the, the German occupied part. Um, at the German uh, occupied territories, uh, anti Semitic measures started immediately. Again, they didn't have. Um, um ghettos with uh, closed doors but they had these barbed wire uh, structures that you can see in the sketch so you couldn't go in and out whenever you wanted but it was uh, uh, guarded and they started uh, what they would call the selections that they would get groups of few thousand people in public squares and they would see who is fit to work um or not um, and this went on for a while and also in other places so these are photos from a selection that happened in the italian occupied part and i have it here for two reasons one is that the, the person on the right is a, a family relative from the side of my grandfather but also to show that being in the italian zone didn't completely eliminate uh the the danger but it it was easier to survive in the italian zone but it didn't guarantee uh, survival so it was still um 
you would still have a bad time. The percentage of the community that was lost is very, very high. It's uh, up there with Hungary and Poland. People don't talk about it as much because the numbers are not um, as uh, big, but the, the percentage is still very, very high. It was really uh, devastating for the community. My grandfather uh, was um, uh, one of the people who was um, selected for work in a forced labor camp and he managed to escape. He was one of the few people who managed to escape and uh, he figured out that the Italian zone was uh, easier. So he walked through Albania, which was occupied by Italy back then. And this is how he, he managed to survive. And my grandmother and my great uh, grandfather had dug a bunker under the house and they had they would hide there when uh, um, a resistance fighter would let them know that the Germans are coming and they would hide there and they also managed to hide. Uh, they made the bunker uh, big enough to have also a sack of wheat uh, inside so they had um some provisions for for uh, food this is a photo of them after the war because you can see also my mom as a little child uh, uh, in the photo um many things in salonica were lost the uh, jewish cemetery which was the biggest in the balkans is completely gone uh, also you can see in the circle that the the greeks I uh, used the tombstones as construction material uh, for the various uh, um, things they needed to do, including pavement and sidewalks and uh, repairing uh, um, churches and uh, so on. And many of the, the houses of people who, repaired, who returned were occupied, so then they had to further uh, leave and this diminished the the community even further. Some went to New York, some went to, to Israel, some stayed in Greece, of course, but very few. Some uh, left directly, were taken from the joint, directly from camps to, to other places. So for example, in, in my uh, family archive, we have uh, people who were taken from the uh, joined directly to the USA or Brazil, or some people even in, in Barcelona, and uh, coincidentally on the same street that I actually uh, live right now and I'm talking to you from. Uh, there is a film that's called The Dust of Time that is very artistic and poetic that kind of shows these events, but doesn't call them by name, because as I said, it's more on the artistic side, so all these events are happening, but you kind of need to know from the context. So uh, do watch it, but don't expect a, a documentary. So um, what's the situation nowadays? Uh, these uh, photos are, uh, I'm the little one in both photos, and these are from the 80s, and uh, you can see that uh, Salonika is still central in, in our life uh, nowadays. Um, this is where we would go for any kind of occasion. Um, the families and the practice, uh, in my experience, was more uh, related to what we would call nowadays modern Orthodox or uh, Reformodox, some people call it. So people were very keen on the customs, all the, the tarbut and part, but they were not necessarily uh, halachically um, uh, educated on all occasions. So I'm saying this because some of my friends in my generation, they have the preconception that the further back you go, the more religious people were. But I find that at least in the Greek Sephardi communities, this is not necessarily true. So you, you could still find all kind of... Um, situations. Uh, some tradition, of course, remains. So you will find the old uh, style traditional uh, shuls where you have the beam in the center and then the chairs are looking inwards. Uh, but of course, uh, this goes hand in hand with a new, uh, with the necessity for new 
um, uh, communities or buildings to be built. So you also have modern uh, schools. This is for Athens, for example, where you have all the chairs facing the, the bima, which is near the, the arc. Um, the, something that has remained a lot is the tradition around food. So you will still find a lot of uh, fish for uh, Sabbat or uh, Rosh Hashanah and other occasions. Uh, you will still find a lot of cooking with aubergines and olive oil, which uh, is common in the in what we call like the the Near East. But in the Iberian Peninsula, peninsula uh, if you were seen cooking with aubergines or olive oil, it was seen by the Inquisition uh, as an indication that you were Jewish. So people kept this cooking tradition. Uh, even at the danger of the, their uh, their life, um, this is how important it it was uh, for them. Um, music is also central to identity, so there are many lamentation uh, songs in in Greece, especially in the Romaniote communities in the west of Greece, and this also uh, passed to uh, to Sephardic tradition. We can, um, this and later if we have time and another topic that i want to talk about because again i get asked about it in in several uh, contexts is if there is anti-semitism in greece especially uh, nowadays so um there is good progress on many things uh there the relations with uh, Israel have been improved greatly during the past couple of decades, and the press has been more objective than the past in how they report uh, the, the news. There is a Holocaust Memorial Museum planned to be built in Salonika. Uh, it ha they haven't started building yet, but it has been uh, agreed upon. There are some publications on the right. You can see there is a book um, on uh, um, a Greek Jewish history, which is published by a mainstream publisher. So this is not anymore something that you have to go to the community offices to find as it was before, but you can go to a mainstream uh, bookstore in, in Athens or at the airport and you can um, get this book. So there definitely uh, is uh, a lot of progress going on. Not everything is good. So um, the the square that I had the photo before from the, the the selections of the Germans during the war, they plan the municipality plans to do a parking lot on it instead of a memorial. Um, there is of course some backlash, but uh, there is no firm decision on what is going to happen yet. Um, and uh, you can see on the right, there is a map that shows um, in which countries you find more exceptionalism in Europe and uh, uh, Greeks have a quite high percentage of, of uh, thinking that uh, um, their culture is uh, better than others, which creates uh, problems in, in perceptions. Um, there are also um, many desecrations of memorials and the uh, cemeteries and also uh, the press can still be bad on occasions. For example, the um, uh, scientist of uh, Alex Burlauf, Greek Sephardic origin, uh, who also won the Genesis Prize for advancing the Pfizer vaccine against COVID. Uh, with a um, family originating from Salonika, and then the press uh, in, in Greece was negative to that to a certain extent, some of the press, I have to say. So it's not easy to have a clear cut. People want a yes and a, or a no uh, answer, but things are progressing and regressing at the same time. So it's very difficult to say. I know there are communities, especially in Athens or and in New York that say, no, there is no anti-Semitism. And then you go to other communities in uh, Salonika or in uh, Seattle, and they say, yes, there's loads of anti-Semitism. Um, I think they're talking about uh, slightly different things. Uh, so 
you can focus on the positive on on the negative and i think that both have a point and uh, what they say is true so you're not in any kind of physical danger if you go and visit Greece. So that's the main point. You can go visit. It's lovely. You should, I think, if you can. Uh, they had, for example, uh, a Hanukkah event outside uh, in Athens, which was really lovely to see. It's in modern times unprecedented to be able to do something like that. But also they installed bulletproof, bulletproof glass at the offices of the community. So you see there are both kinds of things, but there's not a lot, there's not physical violence. So there is, I call it antisemitism by a thousand paper cuts because you will get a lot of ignorance. You will get nasty comments by people who uh, uh, don't know better, but you're not in any kind of actual danger. So um, go visit but i wouldn't go to to live back there i'm happy to be uh in catalonia here i i'm doing a tour of our uh lovely uh, culture center in the old uh, city in, in barcelona i think that was uh, a quick overview if you do want to know to more to know more um I recommend some books. So the one uh, on the left, Salonika City of Ghosts, um, is not specific for the Jewish community. It talks about the whole city, including the relations between the uh, community. It's written by Mark Mazauer, who is a historian. Uh, however, it is uh, a light read. It's not for university students, so it's easy to consume, and I totally recommend it. Um, it's a really well studied and objective uh, work. Then there is uh, Joy Salonica, which is by Devin Nard, and this focuses more on uh, Joy Salonica. He has done an excellent uh, job on collecting facts and uh, data. I would say that some points uh, you will see that he interjects his own opinions, and you're allowed to agree or disagree with, uh, with him, but the facts are quite solid, so it's a good uh, read also. And then by uh, Nicola Stavroulakis, the cookbook of the Jews of Greece. This is an absolute jewel of a book. It has all the recipes that my, my grandma used to cook and many, many more. Uh, so I totally uh, recommend it. I think that should be my 45 minutes. So I don't have any more uh, slides. So I think now we should have time for um, uh, questions, questions and uh, a Q&A. Wonder, wonderful. Thank you so much, Evan, for that very, very informative um, presentation. And yes, we did have um, some questions that came in and I will now open the chat um, so that folks can send their questions publicly. And um, Dani, if you want to uh, keep an eye on the chat at, to see if more questions come in as we are going. That would be wonderful. Um, so a couple of people asked about the fire, the 1917, I believe it was, fire, um, if it was set deliberately or accidental or sort of the cause of, if the cause of the fire was known. Um... No, the, the cause of the fire is not known, but we cannot exclude an accidental fire because of the, um, the planning permission. They wouldn't, the, the planning authorities fearing the transition from the um, Ottoman Empire to, to Greece, um, they didn't allow the enlargement of the Jewish quarter. So the the people had to expand their houses inwards, so the streets became very, very narrow. Uh, so it could be an accidental fire, but it was more easily grown because of the lack of proper planning for the Jewish quarter. So there was prejudice did play a role in this aspect for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, the synagogue that you showed in the picture, can you tell us where that is? Um, and also, if, um, if there are any 
synagogues or community shuls that are open and thriving now in Greece? Yes, uh, so there are three in uh, um, Salonika and there are two in Athens. Um, and in Athens, one is quite small and it's the old Romaniot uh, synagogue and the other one is bigger and like Sephardic. But nowadays you can um, go to either, depending on how many people attend the, the service, like um for the you cannot exp like for high holidays the the big one is is used in salonica one of them is very interesting to visit because it's the only one that has survived uh, before the as it was before the the war because the red cross was using it as a uh, as a storage center for medicine, it was not damaged at all. So um, you should um, the the museum in both Athens and Salonika they have an updated uh, list of contacts. So either email the museum or just go and visit, and they're going to arrange uh, contacts for you. Because I don't have the latest people to. To call, I've been abroad a few years now. Uh, so, the museum is the 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 best place to go visit to get your contacts updated, so that that you know when you can visit uh, its place. Okay, thank you very much. Did you? Sorry, did I miss it? Did you um, share where that picture was? Which of the synagogues the picture was? So the new one was in Salonika, the new one was in Athens, and the old one was in Salonika. Okay, thank you. Um, has the Salonika, uh, Salonika Cemetery been restored? No, not at all. Uh, actually, the, the University of Salonika is now built on top of the cemetery, so there is no uh, chance it is going to, to be restored. Okay, um, and let's see, one more question, a couple more questions. One that takes us back to, um, back a little earlier. Why, why would um, the people who fled, let's see, I, I'm not sure what this is referring to, but basically why it was Ladino written in Hebrew, in the Hebrew letters and the Hebrew script and not, um, and not in the same script that Spanish is written or we use in English. Um, I don't really know, but I think that one of the reasons is that the it was a common alphabet, at least in Greece, for the Jewish communities, because the Greek uses the Greek alphabet and not Lat Latin alphabet. So in everyday life, of course, you could find some um, um, Ladino writing in the Latin alphabet, but if you wanted a newspaper, for example, that I showed, that you wanted everyone to be able to to read, uh, so then it should you, you, it should be in an alphabet that the, the other Jews were co comfortable with. That makes sense. And I have one more question, and then um, I'm sure some more came in as we were yeah, having the conversation. A okay, so I'll yeah. turn it over to you, Donnie, after this question. Um, where in Greece today are the oldest archaeological evidence of Jewish habitation? So there is uh, of habitation uh, you can find in Athens, in the ancient Agora. You can find uh, a synagogue that is from the 4th century uh, BC. Also in the island of Aegina, which is uh, just a short trip from Athens, you, you also find uh, ruins of an ancient settlement. And there was something that's different. There is an island called uh, Delos, which is in the middle of the Aegean Sea, that it had various uh, religious temples, and you also find the synagogue there. But it was not settlement, so it was only used for um, gatherings of different communities that they would do. They would make decisions. It was kind of a parliament place, let's say. 
Um, so different communities would meet there to take decisions. So, but it was not a permanent uh, settlement. Um, in Salonika, there was also, we don't have, uh, we know that, that there was a community, but we don't have uh, ancient ruins like in Athens or in uh, Agina. Okay, thank you. And Dani, I will turn it over to you now um, with your collection of questions. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Evan. This has been incredibly enlightening, especially for myself, who uh, was just visiting uh, Greece this past summer and got to go to Athens and spend Shabbat there. I was with the Chabad, which had uh, probably around 80 people or so, maybe, maybe more, over 100 people for their Friday night. And then on Saturday morning, I went to the synagogue. Uh, that's the Jewish community of Athens, um, which was beautiful to see, um, you know, more of a rendition of, of Romaniot uh, customs and, and Nusach and style of singing that was there. And it was, it was really beautiful. Um, you might have just said this earlier, so I, I apologize if this is a repeat, but I had a question from before that was asking about the difference in the names of Salonika instead of Thessaloniki uh, and why, why that is the difference there. Um, I think that the difference comes from uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire that uh, uh, in Greek, in Greek, it's Thessaloniki, which was, I think, the name of the sister of Alexander the Great, or I don't know, cousin or aunt, some relative of, of his. And then uh, the Turkish, uh, it was difficult for the Turkish to, to pronounce the th. So they made it uh, Selanik in, in Turkish. And so in Ladino, it stuck Salonika as a mix of the two names, I guess. Oh, oh there we are. OK. Uh, Salonika and, and Thessal Thessaloniki. Uh, understood. Um, do you also, could you tell us, um, I, I guess, a little bit more about the, if there's any communities in Salonika and Thessaloniki today? I know so much was wiped out uh, during World War II. Yeah, it's difficult to have uh, numbers, concrete numbers, because Greece is very close to Israel. So, so, so many people uh, move between Salonika and uh, Haifa or Holland. Uh, or Zurma uh, says that there is a community there also. Uh, so I would say, so the numbers, uh, if you try to find out, they range from two to 8,000, which is like four times the, the wow. initial number. <laughs> uh, I know it's a big variation, but it has to do with people moving back and forth. Um, in Athens, um, the community was traditionally smaller, but the youth center recently is doing some amazing things. So it's still very, it's very vibrant. And there are smaller communities in uh, Volos and uh, Larissa, which are in central uh, Greece. And then in other places like Trikala or um, Yanana, you maybe find like 50 people it's difficult to count because uh, the Greek state has a law that you have to have 20 families to form a community. So, so many suburbs or places that were outside the municipality proper because they don't have uh, an official community, uh, they are more like solitary Jews. So it's difficult to, to find out how to count these individual people. Yeah, and I know there's uh, like very few remaining original Romanio Jews in Corfu and Yonina and uh, other places that you were mentioning. Um, uh, kind of a random off topic question, but maybe you know, some people are looking to visit Greece and would love to be connected with communities there. I don't know if you have any recommendations. Um, I actually can put a recommendation of a wonderful guide that I met in Athens. Um, but I was wondering, Evan, if you wanted to put your email address in the chat, and that way people who have questions to follow up with you can. It seems like there's a lot of people who have wonderful connections to Greece um, and, and are just so thankful for, for your incredibly informative 
um, uh, presentation today. Um, oh, while you're doing that, I also had another personal question that I thought it'd be fun for you to share. Um, I Could you tell us the days of the week in Greek? Because I understand from our guide that we had in Athens, when you translate them, it's like, like the way to say Saturday is like the rest day and the way to say Friday is the day of preparation and the way to say Sunday is like the first day, like Yom Rishon, like we say in Hebrew. I don't know, maybe you could tell us what the days of the week or at least the weekend are in Greek and uh, share that little bit with us, which, is, which I found fascinating. Yes, sure. Um, so um, Shabbat is uh, Sabato. So it's very, it's the same word, basically. And um, Friday is Paraskevi, which like preparation. <laughs> um, yeah. Then Sunday is not called first day anymore, but uh, you can figure out that it was because Monday is called second day. So it's the Deftera, which is second day. Um, but uh, yeah, so it still keeps the same uh, order of, of, of the days. Um, there's a couple more questions if you could let us know about the Athens Jewish community, if there's a day school there, uh, what may, perhaps what the population is like there. Um, I, I can just speak from my experience, which I, I definitely know that there was a Chabad and then the Jewish community of Athens. Um, which I didn't know exactly how many people formed part of that. Yeah, so there is a school in uh, Athens. There is a there is in Salonika and also in Volos and Larissa, uh, and they also give uh, scholarships uh, for uh, uni. So they're quite um, good um, uh, schools. Um, they have um, also Hebrew lessons. Of course, the language of instruction is in, in uh, Greek. Um, and again, for the contacts, I would say that the, the best thing to do is to go to the museum and there to get the updated list of contacts because also because of the recent recession, many people moved out of Greece and it's like difficult to keep for individuals to keep up to date but the museum is the, the central hub of information let's say. Great thank you so much and uh, I'm also putting here in the chat um, Salvador who was uh, was our guide in Athens so if anyone would like to follow up uh, they're going to Athens that's that's to help out those people who are traveling. Um, Oh, this is uh, very exciting. We have someone on the line named Marvin Marcos, who's the president of the Kehila Kedoshah, Janina, which is the only Romaniot Kehila in the Western Hemisphere, and, and it's at, actually New York City. So it's a, such a pleasure and honor to have Marvin, uh, who's on uh, on our presentation today. So that's really, really uh, exciting. And yeah, when I was visiting uh, Yonona, I heard that there's not such a large population there in the city, but actually the larger population is in New York City, which is which is really exciting. Um, yeah, there I, is also a Greek Jewish festival that they do. Um, so the, the it's in near the Tenement Museum. If you are in uh, New York, um, Broom Street, I think. Um, another question that just, oh, we're actually looking like we're, this will be our last question, right, Julie? Because it seems like we're getting pretty close to time here. Um, I never like, and I don't like ending on this question, but there was, of course, a question of what, if any, uh, anti-Semitism, as you mentioned earlier, uh, is in Greek uh, Cyprus relative to Greece itself. So I don't know if there's a difference, if you've heard of, or if you have an update for that. Um surely there is a lot of stereotyping again there is no danger there is no reason why you shouldn't visit of course uh, it's more difficult if you try to live there but for a visit it's okay but the stereotyping has various aspects so there is also this uh, 
in Cyprus, they see um, Jewish communities more in a positive light that up to the point of stereotyping that, oh, we should stick together like the Jews. So it's this kind of um, stereotyping. Um, we have to learn from them. Uh, and of course, with all the, the implicit prejudice that comes um, from that. But I think that they, they have taken a better care of the few monuments that are there. You don't see so many. There are two uh, Jewish cemeteries in Cyprus, and they, you don't see them desecrated as often as you see cemeteries in, in Greece, for example. So I think the, the state does a better job. Understood. And just as a, a happy note, Jordan over here on the chat is putting uh, some great links to the uh, festival that you were referring to, um, which uh, which looks really wonderful, the Greek Jewish Festival in New York. So hopefully everyone can click on that, yeah. uh, kkjfestival.com. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm not as knowledgeable with Zoom as Danny, so the chat <laughs> was too fast for me to follow. So sorry if I haven't answered to your question, but it was so many of them. Please uh, do take note of uh, Evan's email to follow up with him, and then Julie. Perhaps we can also like send out, you know, a couple of the links that that Evan can share with us, as we've done in the past, um, because it just looks like there's we had almost 800 people uh, with us today. It's such great interaction to learn about um, Jewish Greece uh, and learning from Evan, which was fantastic. So, Todarova, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Evan. Thank you also, of course, to Donnie. Um, and thank you to all of you who um, who came here today and, um, and joined us at My Jewish Learning and Jewish Telegraphic Agency um, for this really, really informative and wonderful program. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier and also in the chat box, the, I know some people came late and they want to watch the beginning um, or they want to see it again. We will be sending you the direct, uh, you the link for the video in an email. So watch for your email. Um, and we will also be sending out information for our next tour very soon. So look out for that information as well. Um, wishing everyone a good rest of your week. And we hope to see you next time. Thanks again, Evan. Danny and everyone. Take care.